Hello, everybody, and welcome to Intel on AI. I am your host, Ryan Carson, and it is wonderful to be with you today. We have got a wonderful guest today named Anil Nanduri from our own Intel. How are you today, and what is happening? Hey, Ryan. It's great to catch up. Uh, I know it's been a while, but uh, super excited about, you know, uh, what we are doing with uh, AI and, uh, you know, and how we are trying to scale this into a market. But uh, a lot of work ahead, but uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous uh, journey. It's going to be exciting to, to get there. We've got a lot to talk about. But first, for everybody listening, a little bit about Anil. He is a vice president here at Intel, and he's the head of our AI Accelerator office. With over 25 years at Intel, he was part of the leadership team that established Intel's graphics business. Prior to this, he successfully led Intel's drone division, creating a profitable enterprise from the ground up which included the development of a large scale drone light show swarm and commercial drone solutions. I really want to ask more about that later. Uh, his efforts were instrumental in bringing the Intel real sense technology to the marketplace, establishing and expanding the netbook category and facilitating the widespread adoption of Intel Centrino mobile technology for PCs. Anil who has served on the NASA advisory committee, jealous holds three patents and has earned three Intel Achievement Awards for his contribution. It is awesome to have you here on the show. So let's dig right in. What is the enterprise AI opportunity? Actually, Ryan, this is a great question. And I think uh, if you want to look at, you know, AI has been there for, you know, kind of decades. Um, and, you know, if people really dig one level deeper into what AI is about, uh, we can call it, you know, statistical AI, classical AI, primarily machine learning and deep learning. Uh, that's where the last decade, a lot of AI activities have been going on. Uh, you know, you've used Alexas of the world, the series of the world. Uh, you've, you've been uh, you, you know, exposed through uh, like recommendations coming in through, you know, what we do through our social media and other channels. Um, you know, we've got that kind of AI uh, where you are looking through predictive uh, nature of inspections and you're detecting falls and things like that. But over the last five years or so, a new phenomena of generative AI has come in, right? And then this is where, you know, if you kind of really look back, it was a paper in 2017 uh, that was called Attention is All You Need. It kind of changed uh, uh, the way AI would be, you know, architected and, uh, and, and processed. And uh, the transformer architecture is the fundamental kind of change that has actually come in. And that transformer architecture kind of helped bring a new wave of innovation in the AI space called generative AI, where you're actually being able to look at you know, the, uh, the semantic understanding of large uh, languages and being able to predict uh, the outcomes from it. Um, and the rise of the LLMs uh, came up. Right. And so when we talk about enterprises and, you know, and, and what is the AI opportunity is that, you know, ability to have human like understanding with a lot of enterprise like data. Um, and that's what's kind of driving this new wave of excitement, innovation is that, hey, I can now begin to deal with my complex data and enterprises with a very simple human like interaction. Right. Uh, and, 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 and so, so that's what is exciting about it. Now, the opportunity for something like this, right, uh, is um, phenomenal, right? And it spans across every segment of uh, enterprise verticals, be it, you know, from healthcare to, you know, uh, travel to retail to, you know, um, you know, uh, life sciences, manufacturing. So think of sc scenarios where, you know, we have a lot of history of data that you've accumulated, uh, but our ability to search and uh, work on that data is actually very limited. And, and what Gen AI is bringing in is our ability to kind of bring that human-like understanding and to ask simple questions and have AI tools now go address uh, and give us very complex answers in a very simple way, right, that we can actually uh, digest it. So that, if you kind of look at it from an opportunity uh, by 2027, 2028, we are looking at like five, six X of what AI spend in enterprises is about. I mean, um, in the last year or so, it's about 40 billion in enterprise AI, uh, which is more the traditional AI. And it's projected to go over 250 billion uh, in uh, AI spend in enterprises uh, over the next five years. Wow. It's a slight jump. 
It's a big jump. Yeah. It's exciting. And now that we're seeing, e even today, things are being announced where the latency on these models is getting so small that we can have these realistic conversations with our data. I just can't wait to see how this actually gets rolled out in the enterprise. So that kind of leads to my next question, which is, okay, there's clearly an enterprise AI opportunity. Um, but the question is, what do enterprises need in that enterprise AI opportunity solution? Uh, Ryan, good question. And so I think we got to break this down, right? And I think uh, there is uh, the question is how are, you know, uh, how is the AI evolving and how will enterprises adopt to it? And then, you know, and what problems are we trying to solve? So if you kind of look at it from the AI evolution in the gener uh, generative AI space, what you saw up till now is, you know, the GPT-4, you know, you talk about, you know, Gemini, or you talk about, you know, a Llama, which is coming from Meta, or Claude from Anthropic. These are all what we call large language models, where they're taking trillions of, uh, you know, uh, uh, tokens that are trained um, on large language models. Now, when you're saying you're training on large language models, what does that really mean? They're training on data that is web crawled, right? And so it's openly available in the internet, right? Um, and so uh, these are large uh, computationally intensive models, but they're getting super good at understanding uh, human intent and uh, semantic search intents of, uh, you know, natural language. So we are able to query very easily and it's able to understand us, right? Now, it's still very LLM, which is large language model. Now, the next ev evolution of this is going to be multimodal, which is like using videos, images, uh, you know, other kinds of data sets, which then become multimodal as well, right? And so there's an uh, evolution of LLMs to VLLM, VLMs, and, you know, other kinds of models that are going on. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what LLMs are doing today, we can call them our AI assistants. They're like a co-pilot. They're helping us, you know, uh, like an intern, being able to assist uh, in some uh, uh, outcomes, but they're not really owning uh, the outcomes, okay? Um, so we call this the first wave of, you know, call it, you know, the age of co-pilots or age of uh, AI assistants. Now, while this is still trained on, you know, public data, 85% of world's data, by the way, is sitting behind enterprise firewalls. Okay. Now, wow. it's this ocean of ocean data. Ocean of data. And, and this is super high pr you know, proprietary. It could be your confidential customer information. It could be your confidential manufacturing data. It's your, you know, IP of uh, your design and performance metrics. Um, and so these, some of this, both, there's an element of structured data and unstructured data that's sent behind enterprise firewalls. Now, this data needs to then get plugged into these uh, AI models so they can be either trained or fine-tuned or, you know, uh, inferenced with so that we can get the most up-to-date and most accurate information. So that part of it is sitting behind enterprise firewalls. Now, enterprises need to actually take this information and then, you know, kind of you know, kind of, uh, uh, what can we say? Either, you know, create new AI co-pilots that are more specialized towards your domain-specific data uh, and find a way to make the AI assistance uh, more domain-specific, right? Um, because you want to have, if you're like in that Intel, you're doing a lot of coding, right? You want, uh, and, and our coding is different from a Python or a software coding. Our coding is chip design, right? So you want an AI model that's specialized in chip design. It probably needs to be uh, adapting an LLM to kind of merge the, the chip design language that we use so that, you know, person who's a designer can get the right outcomes of uh, a chip design uh, assistant, right? Um, and so, uh, this wave of work has to happen. Um, and then as these AI assistants evolve, the next world we can think about is, you know, here it's still assisting a human. Think of AI agents. Now, an agent is in the term definition is that it can not only, you know, give you a uh, uh, recommendation, it can also tell you an outcome and an action that it can perform. 
Okay. Um, and so now an AI agent, imagine booking a flight ticket for you based on a set of requirements that you've given, right? Um, that's what an agent is doing. Not only has it told you an itinerary, it's actually researched and made a, you know, recommendation of uh, the right time, the flight, number of stops, the, 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 the pricing, whatever it is. And it actually tells you, hey, I've gone ahead and put a request for an order, please review, right? Um, or a supply chain problem where in enterprises where you're trying to see when to order your next set of uh, you know raw materials and the AI agent actually analyzes your supply chain and tells you hey you're going to be low on your inventory for these and we're going to here's a PO go approve it right um, that's an agentic function um, and the future of agent uh, is the next evolution and all this are happening in research is uh, is a, called an AI function which means that it's a multiple agent. Imagine a supply chain working with a finance agent, working with a legal agent, and you know you are now getting a, a full department of expertise. Uh, you know where they're actually interacting. You know um, um, uh, now it's a team, right? And so that's called an AI function. So so you can think of age of you know, co-pilots, age of agents, and age of uh, uh, functions. Now, if you speak to the people in the ecosystem, uh, the research is very far along uh, in terms of all of these. Uh, but adoption, we are still very much in enterprise, haven't even got to the, you know, the agentic world yet, right? The, the Not even the, you know, assistive world yet, right? So that's where we are very, at the very early part of this journey. Um, and uh, there's a lot of opportunity as this uh, evolution continues. Absolutely. It, when we start to actually connect this ocean of data to the power of large language models or even small language models uh, that are highly tuned, it's going to unlock so much productivity and creativity. Um, I can just imagine that, folks, when we actually interact with these uh, agentic functions and teams, and it actually knows everything about your work and your private documents and everything you need, it really will unlock um, a lot of power. And I know that Intel works very excited about the fact that we understand private compute and we understand the entire solution uh, that enterprises need before they feel comfortable using this. So on that note, there's a lot to think about uh, with retrieval augmented generation. Uh, there's a lot going on with solutions. I know that Intel we're focusing deeply on this. So what are your thoughts on uh, some of the things that we're thinking about uh, tackling the future? Yeah. So, so now it comes down to, you know, how do we approach in enterprises a solution that can scale, right? And, and so if you think about, you know, what are the big problems that enterprises are facing, right? Uh, first of all, you know, I have a lot of data, but I'm not sure, you know, uh, what happens to my data. Am I kind of giving my IP uh, even if my data is, you know, hosted by me, there is the, you know, metadata information that is actually, you know, kind of think of the AI, you know, models are continuously learning, right? And so if you're going to go feed your, your proprietary data into an AI model that's sitting out there in the open, it's continuously learning about your information. At some point, it's going to get better than, you know, uh, you know, it's going to know about your competition. It's going to know about, you know, the, your, your set of the, you know, verticals that you're in. It, it kind of knows what future your problems to predict. And so you soon get to a risk of, uh, you know, your proprietary information, uh, you know, uh, and an AI, uh, you know, model that is knows more than what, the, you know, your teams know. And so that's a concern, a huge concern in terms of, you know, enterprise adoption. Uh, the second part of it is what is proprietary, what is generic? So for a company like, you know, that is specializing in, say, um, you know, in some, you know, very, very forward looking, you know, vaccine research or some, you know, life science research um, for them. Customer support may be a very horizontal function, uh, and it's not like answering customer questions about, you know, uh, their medications or, you know, or, you know, or things like that. Uh, it's a very, very horizontal function, may not have too much IP in there, but, but it is a function that they still need to perform because they have to interact with a lot of customers, uh, like customer support. Now, when you get into these use cases for for a customer like for a for a company like that that may not be a big concern on ip 
but for a, a retail uh, vendor, customer support is actually an IP uh, amount of data. So for them, their customer information is their you know, core expertise and core knowledge and co proprietary data. So for them, they will look at customer support in a different lens uh, than uh, a manufacturing company, right? And and so we need to kind of help bridge uh, the customers in terms of, okay, what are the different you know hierarchies of data? Uh, which ones are critical uh, and core? Which ones are like kind of uncore or you know kind of more horizontal? And and these functions then need to be kind of uh, streamlined and saying, okay, how can I use Gen AI capabilities? Um, and so, uh, where uh, the other part of this is, where is all this data stored? Okay, and 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 data, you know, uh, compliance and regulatory needs require different kinds of ways data have to be managed uh, in enterprises. Uh, there are regulatory requirements. There's compliance requirements. There's locality requirements. Uh, you know, using GDPR as an example, you know, what sits within a, a country, a region, uh, a state. You know, all these have to be kind of you know are regulated, right? And so they need to be managed, right? Um, and they've traditionally been running on you know databases that sit on cpu you know hosted clusters of or of uh, data centers right um, over the last decade you know that's cloud has been and or whether it's on prem or cloud they've been hosting a lot of this data now gen ai models run on accelerators right and so they're super efficient for it um, and they're you know uh, kind of uh, both open source models and closed models and they've been you know uh, whether it's an open AI, which is a closed model, versus a Llama, which is an open source model, right? Uh, these are all Gen AI models that you want to leverage the semantic understanding and you want to leverage the, 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 the capabilities of those models, right? And how do I connect these two worlds? Okay. Um, do I need to move all this data over and, and take it to where the models are running? Or do I need to take the models and run it to where the data exists? And we know that the computationally there are there are you know kind of uh, differences that each of these platforms need. One's a CPU, one's a GPU. So how can I connect these two worlds? This is what we at Intel have been working with, and so is the ecosystem, right? Um, and so um, and how do I make the data more up to date? So when I'm asking a question, hey, you know, what is the you know uh, my uh, customer you know response and and on, on a support issue you know what came up like 24 hours ago while the model that i'm using may be trained six months ago so how do i get the latest data in the response to a customer query hey this customer has called us like two days back and this was the issue and this is a follow-up that's needed the model doesn't know all that right and, and so we need to kind of incorporate the ever-changing new data that's coming in every day and so that you can get them to the user of this, whether it's a customer service agent, getting the most up-to-date and most accurate and most, uh, you know, uh, actionable information to help them on the task at hand, right, or her. Um, and so RAG is an implementation, retrieval augmented generation, where you can take an existing model that is pre-trained but you can augment it with real-time data that comes in and still get an effective, prioritized, uh, you know, actionable outcomes, which is uh, most accurate, right? And so it's one of the tools that are being uh, becoming very popular uh, in the enterprise domain and, uh, and a lot of innovation happening here. And uh, this is where, how quickly can I get my response? How quickly can the data be ingested? So how quickly can I get the accurate answers becomes very, very critical. So latency is a very uh, you know, big factor in here. Now, there are so many different RAG implementations. There is no standardized approach to RAG implementation. So when I are an enterprise, you know, you know, if you look at, you know, what enterprises have adopted, whether it's Linux, whether it's Kubernetes, they've always been, you know, open APIs, um, and it's like a standards-based approach. It's not necessarily open source, but it's open, right? And so that they can choose different vendors, they can choose different architectures, they can diff choose different implementations, yet they can have the flexibility of a consistent deployment uh, that can, you know, kind of, uh, you know, work with uh, enterprise needs and enterprise grade, if you want to think about it, right? And so 
that I think becomes the essence of what kind of a you know stack is needed for enterprises to bring generative AI and accelerate that adoption through it. Because right now there's a lot of experimentation, but not a clear you know kind of a consistent path. Because every uh, enterprise is experimenting with w- what they think they should be doing. Right, and so. Uh- I know that we're pushing on the open platform for enterprise AI to try to address some of these things. So how does that work and and um, what's happening with that? Yeah. So if you kind of look back at it, right, you want to think of two worlds, right? Hey, you know, there's a very closed proprietary ecosystem that's uh, driven by what, uh, you know, our competition, uh, NVIDIA primarily with CUDA and the layers of stack. They're trying to do full turnkey services vertically. Right. And then offering that's the strategy they've applied. But, you know, uh, you know, you can think of it as Android versus Apple in some ways. Right. Uh, You know, it's it's a it's an interesting way. But if you look at in the data center domain and in the in the in the ecosystem of enterprises, it's long been a very open ecosystem. Right. And so uh, there is a lack of standards with Gen AI deployments. uh, And and this is where, you know, Intel, along with a bunch of uh, other companies, under the Linux Foundation, kickstarted the OPEA, uh, Open Platform for Enterprise AI. Uh, the charter of this is to exactly solve the problem, is to figure out how we can bring in enterprise use cases like RAG um, and make a deployment stack that is uh, uh, open and interoperable, right? And now it doesn't necessarily mean all pieces are open source. But but clearly, you know, it has the flexibility to have both, you know, open source as well as, uh, you know, uh, closed elements of the stack uh, that uh, can be uh, uh, brought together. Now, we've contributed a lot of code uh, around that towards the RAG implementations, and we'll see more about it in that innovation. Um, actually, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, but uh, that motion is already ongoing, and there's a lot of interest excitement and partners that are coming more and more together to participate in this, uh, you know, uh, uh, workflow. Now, um, and, and, and the, uh, the opportunity for us here is to kind of, you know, look at what is the closest equivalent of something like this. Uh, you know, Kubernetes is a great, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, layer. There's multiple different implementations of Kubernetes. Linux is another great example. There are multiple vendors in Linux, but you know, the the stack is uh, very interoperable. Um, and so you will see Gen AI in enterprises have some kind of a similar, you know, view of it. Uh, you know, um, and, and 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 orchestration uh, in the ecosystem. Absolutely. When I saw uh, Opia get announced, it felt a lot like the Open Compute Project, where uh, you really want to push the yeah, standard forward, yes. yeah. right, yes. so that everybody can build on top of it with multiple vendors and not be, you know, locked in. Um, yeah. And uh, that's one of the big. Re- I joined Intel recently, and one of the big reasons is because we're so forward thinking on open source and open standards. And um, I think that's good for AI devs. We want more choice. Um, and, and we want more compatibility. And, and, and then the debates out there, if you look at even with the models, right, you, you're starting to see Llama versus GPT, which one's better, right? You know, one's open source, the other one is closed. Um, and, you know, and uh, if you kind of even look within the Llama hierarchy, you know, Llama 3, 8 billion parameter model is as good as a Llama 2, 70 billion. So yep. there's a lot of innovation where they're trying to bring models smaller, more open source models, you know, um, so this, you know, and we want to build an infrastructure that can actually adapt to this uh, changing environment. Absolutely. It is so exciting to see the models that are being pushed open source. I, just today, uh, SAM2 uh, was announced from Meta, which yeah. is going and, and the data set uh, that they, they train it on. And it's just so exciting uh, to see what companies are going to be able to do because they can use this tooling without having to be locked in or, or yeah. behind a certain vendor. And, and right now let's connect that to enterprises, right? And so the other part of enterprises concern is about trust and, and, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, AI model, you know, uh, behaviors, right? So you've seen examples where the, one of the AI models actually ended up, you know, uh, helping customers for a, you know, airline company, you know, get a wrong price or book a ticket, um, you know, or give a wrong recommendation, um, you know, yeah, yeah, and so uh, you know, Gemini when it launched, uh, it had a lot of bias built in, um, and it was giving wrong answers. So you know, for enterprises to adopt this and to trust 
the AI uh, you know recommendations to their end customers they need to have the you know visibility into how the models were trained uh, they need to understand the biases that were deployed uh, into the model tuning. Um, and so this is where it's super critical where, you know, how do enterprises trust the model to, you know, uh, to the outcomes that they need to be, you know, responsible for uh, to their end customers. Um, and uh, this is another area of, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, discussions and debates going on is that, you know, can the, does the, you know, how much of transparency of the AI model do you need to have uh, to have a visibility into the outcomes? And, and this is where an open source model with open, you know, you know, you're already seeing trends where some say, oh, we will, we'll release the biases, uh, we'll release uh, some of the weight uh, that you can tune, uh, but the training corpus uh, may not be open. Um, in some cases, you do want to know what you were trained on because, you know, end of the day, the model is as good as what you trained with. And so these are all kind of driving, you know, requirements and driving, you know, uh, you know, implications into how enterprises will adopt AI. And this is one of the reasons by Ryan, it's not going to move as fast as you think, because these are have multi-layered, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, issues that enterprises need to resolve because the consequences of a wrong choice here can be tremendous uh, economically as well as reputationally. Absolutely. So, um, to, to finish off, uh, would just to hear, love to hear your, your guess and conjecture. I firmly believe that every company, every enterprise, every country, every family is going to be running a rag like solution where you have your data, um, being used specifically on top of a model. When do you think it will be, uh, necessary for a company to have a rag like solution just to keep up? Like how far are we away from that? Um, I think, by the way, it's immediate in the context of, you know, it's a layered approach, right? Um, like I said, each company is going to look at what is my core proprietary information versus what is my, you know, more needed to, you know, uh, is not as critical. And you'll start to see deployments starting with not so critical. Um, you know, you know, actually, one of the good examples is Intel as a customer zero to some of the enterprise implementation. As you know, we have a very strong manufacturing, you know, process, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, infrastructure, highly proprietary, highly confidential, and rest assured that data is not going to leave, uh, you know, a firewall of Intel, let alone may not even leave the premises, okay, because that's how critical that data is, versus dealing with all our customer support and, you know, our supply chain and, you know, the external partners that we work with, right? And you're going to start to see, you know, where do I need, you know, more semantic understanding, helping my customer support get better answers, you know, not as super confidential. So think of our layers of, you know, Intel, you know, public information, Intel confidential information, and Intel top secret information, right? And so I could probably probably take some implementations and take the Intel public information and have a rag like implementation with not that much of a risk uh, to the business. Right. And so you can see that phase of deployments happening faster. Right. Um, then as I go up into more of the domain specific uh, details and more proprietary and more IP related topics that the rag implementations, maybe do I need a custom model? Do I need a, you know, an open source model that is uh, retrained on my data? These then become, you know, or it's fine-tuned that we do it ourselves. So those become uh, decision trees that uh, will then decide, okay, when is that, uh, you know, mature enough to go deploy, right? And so I think you'll start, you're already starting to see Gen AI deployments uh, starting from that, uh, you know, uh, you know, assistive uh, nature uh, that are less, uh, you know, mission critical, uh, uh, less risky, and then kind of work yourself into uh, more uh, higher order, you know, uh, functions. Now, again, that's just the one wave. Then we remember we talked about that's the co-pilot world or the, you know, assistive world, but then going into agents and going into functions still is a different step function of evolution. So you're going to see this, you know, multi-step uh, uh, flow. And if you had to say, when does Gen AI and enterprises begin? I would say now. Um, now, when when do you think we'll be fully deployed? I think uh, uh, that is is more of a, you know, interesting question. I think uh, um, I would say, 
never in the history we have seen uh, an implication of a technology like Gen AI, like from the days of where internet came out, right? And so, you know, the profound impact, you know, now you can ask how quickly did internet scale? Right. Um, for some people, it will say, oh, it was just a few years, but, you know, it's continuing to scale as right. we speak, right? So, and evolve, right? So I think it's one of those where it's a step function change uh, in how we use AI. Um, and then I think the adoption will continue to evolve. Absolutely. Uh, I think our, the general message is just start your journey now. If you're listening to this show, start looking into it and how your company can start to benefit from exploring uh, various enterprise AI solutions. So Anil, I appreciate your time. You are a very busy guy. Um, and so I uh, appreciate being on the show. If folks want to learn more about what Intel is doing with enterprise AI or check out Opia or anything else, where should they go? Um, we have an OPA website, um, and I think uh, that's a, a great place to learn more about the open uh, platform for enterprise AI initiatives. Uh, the other is stay tuned and look forward to our Intel innovation. Uh, we'll, we'll release and, and share a lot more about uh, the work we are doing uh, for enterprise AI um, and, um, and continue to uh, check uh, on, uh, you know, uh, the ecosystem channels on, you know, uh, how enterprise AI is evolving. Fabulous. Well, thanks again for your time and I will see you at innovation. I'm excited about the show. Excited about seeing everyone that's visiting as well. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. And thanks Ryan. It's, uh, it's great to be here and you have a great show and really, you know, enjoying our discussion and, you know, I'm happy to help with any more information you need and whenever. Thanks a lot. Take care. Visit intel.com forward slash AI to learn more.